Major developments have taken place right now today, and I don't see them on the front of every newspaper, so I'm bringing them directly to you. The first thing that I want to look at is China, the top economy, or are they going for it? Number two is the economy needs stimulus. I will show you the facts around that. And the third thing is China, Russia, and the BRICS nations, how they all come together right now. All of that and more. Let's go. I wanted to begin by taking a look at this article here to set the story for the rest of the video with nothing to sell Vietnam gas stations start to close now this was from several days ago but I wanted to show you what can happen in any place in any environment you can have a disruption that it affects you it could be in the northeast in the United States or it could be in a place like Vietnam deliveries fail to arrive disrupting life in a nation that relies on motorbikes so you could see what's happening all these people are lining up up right now and that causes these disruptions you have civil unrest and you have an issue that cannot be resolved by simply printing money look here oil prices are primed to spike this winter the eu embargo on seaborne russian crude oil exports and the g7 price cap on russian oil are both less than a month away think about what happens here with the disruptions in this case where you have people that simply are unable to pay for what they need their basic essentials food and energy are too expensive right now today look here while a global economic slowdown and weak oil demand in china have capped prices looming supply disruptions will likely send oil prices higher lack of refinery capacity as well that exists in the united states and that also is for other countries look at what's happening in europe today my goodness but that brings me to this the emperor of China plans to visit Saudi Arabia amid global reshuffling. And I think this is really key because when you see what's going on on a global level, there are major disruptions and dislocations from what we used to know as the old order. Riyadh expands ties with Washington rivals that have helped deepen China's influence in the Middle East, where the U.S. once reigned supreme. This is an extremely important event, and it's been several steps along the way. This is also the case of China going towards Saudi Arabia and says, hey, let me shake your hand. Let me pay a visit. This sends a message to the whole world. We are interested in expanding our partnerships and our influence. Do you see what's happening here? For so many decades, we had seen the petrodollar, the U.S. dollar. They were pricing oil only in U.S. dollars, no matter who they were trading with. It gave the United States a monopoly. And in exchange, Saudi Arabia had protection of the oil fields by the U.S. military. A good balance, they would say. But now China is going to go over and say, well, let's do business together. There is also the possibility of Saudi Arabia joining the BRICS nations. We'll talk more about that in a moment. India to continue buying oil from Russia as ties deepen. India's foreign minister says buying oil from its steady and time-tested partner is economically advantageous. Once again, BRICS nations coming together to unify 40% of the world's population and they have expanded their economy on the whole. You look at this from every angle, they've got resources and they have domestic consumption as well. So it's not just about exports necessarily, but also what they are doing between each other. All of this comes together right now today as the United States has started to weaken on its global influence. China has strengthened in that category and we could see the two sides battling Taiwan being the forefront of all of that. It is so imperative that we pay close attention to the economy of China because that's going to be able to determine their trajectory. Take a look at the economic statistics out of China. You can see their exports and their imports year over year change. This has been declining from 2021 into 2022. In some ways, this is beneficial because we have seen the prices of all these shipments coming down. That eases the pressure. That also signifies that the economy is not as hot as it once was before. This is the data. This is the raw data that you can see on many different levels, but this is just one piece of that puzzle, which I've shown you many times. This is important also. In sequential terms, exports of cell phones fell the most in October, followed by LCD panels. Now, I was wondering if this had to do with the lockdowns that were taking place. Certainly could be. 
at the bottom of this, you're seeing rare earths that had been surging. So quite the opposite scenario. And the reason I put this in here was that China has extreme dominance on rare earths, not just the resources in the ground, but the ones actually producing products from this that companies all over the world are reliant on. They are making by far more than any other country. Doesn't matter about the resources in the ground. Who's making it? Who's delivering it? Because just to get a mine set up could take many, many years, not to mention all the regulations. Here we have it. One of China's inflation gauges drops for the first time since 2020. So it goes in with the exports and the imports as well. We're noticing this. If you look in the United States, the CPI wasn't as high as what they thought it was going to be. That's fantastic. Markets were doing very well as a result of that. This goes all over the place, right? Global trade boom reverses course as China exports slump. So we could see this through different pieces of data. And this is the Bloomberg trade tracker. It's showing a more somber outlook for world trade led by slumping sentiment from factories in several key countries. And as they mentioned here, a simple matter of fact is when you look at countries like Germany, which used to have a such strong economy, now it shows that it's anything but, I think it's important that we all follow along and understand that this is a trend based on a cycle, an economic cycle that is created by the central banks and of course the government with their stimulus measures. Here we have it, logistics strains ease for small firms, but inflation remains a top worry. Look, when you were pumping out products from China to the rest of the world and everybody wanted more stuff than they ever had before, that was going to put a lot of pressure at the same time time some of these firms were making more money than they've ever seen but that's important to address that it isn't what it was back in 2020 2021 that is very clear and so we have this look i i just imported a whole bunch of products okay well over a hundred thousand dollars worth and this was zero delay it was like as if it's 2019 so i'm giving you my personal opinion right here and what's happening in my personal situation and there's been no delay there's been nothing wrong with uh, the port issues nothing I've, at least me in my experience and that's coming into la long beach so that's what i am i am seeing personally and the data backs that up as well optimism around U.S. small businesses retreated in October for the first time in four months as the sales outlook worsened. But there were glimmers of hope that supply chain disruptions showing more signs of subsiding. So this is good news overall in general, but if it signifies that we are actually contracting going towards a global recession, well, that's a whole different story. Now, the stock market doesn't care about that. Apparently, the stock market is doing its own thing. Kathy Wood, suddenly people are buying <laughs> that stock, which is uh, kind of funny, uh, but that's the way it goes, right? The most riskiest assets are going to be the ones most attractive. Russia sends oil thousands of miles through Arctic Circle again. Sanctions make the route more appealing to Moscow. Climate, shipping capacity, and crude volume limit routes utility. So, of course, we don't know what's going to happen up in the Arctic because if it's too dangerous, if it's too frozen, if there aren't the pathways that they had before, well, then they can't make it that way. That's why it's kind of avoided. However, they can do that. And Russia is able to move products all around. China's able to move products. And we see this being beneficial to them in some way. Russia sent its second ever crude shipment east through the Arctic Circle toward China, a route that could one day give the country a faster way to buyers in Asia. They use this thing called a specialized ice breaker tanker and it plows through the ice. Now, I don't know how well this works and it depends on the months of the year and so on, but I think it's important to see that there are other ways of moving products that maybe we didn't have before. This is a diagram that I found. I thought it would be interesting just to show you if I could just get a little bit down here to give you an idea. On the right side of the globe, they're showing Russia and you can see Canada on the other and how the stuff can move through. Again, depends on how much ice there is and depends, you know, who knows what's going on up there. This could be an issue, but they're able to do it. They've done it before and perhaps will continue to do so, at least on a limited scale. So this is important just to show us that we have stuff moving all different methods. We've got the pipelines, which had problems. Hey, if you're not going to sign up that pipeline, 
Germany with the Nord Stream 2, well then we're going to have to take uh, measures into our own hands. And that's kind of what we see with Russia today. And I don't know what they're going to do in the near future, but I can tell you right now, they are cozying up to China. Okay, that's very key. That's what I want to hit home in this video today. Global energy-driven inflation may ease as China sees lower growth. Disappointing economic growth in China could help to lower energy-driven inflation on a global scale. Debt levels in China's large real estate sector remain unsustainably high, and there are concerns that contagion might spread beyond the property sector. Now, we don't exactly know how it will unfold, but I could tell you with what's happening in China, this is a concern not just for that one sector in one country, this could envelop the whole world. But you as an individual, you shouldn't be just focused on it all day and think about it and worry about it. No, we should be making these preparations for ourselves. What do we have to do? Well, we want to lessen our dependence on the system. We want to have self-sufficiency. That's what I wrote right here, okay? The two pillars. You got to have some level of self-sufficiency. Are you reliant entirely on one country? If that country that you are in or that you do business with or that you sell products to, is that one country growing or is it shrinking? And what do the relationships with that country and other countries have to do with your business? These are things that must be understood. For a lot of people, they're importing products. They might be a mechanic and they're importing products from India, they're importing products from China to use in their vehicles. Well, what if that gets disrupted? What if you have tariffs and now the prices have shot up through the roof? Is that going to hurt your business? Understand your suppliers, understand your supplies and where they come from and where. You don't have to necessarily change anything, but you should at least have a plan B in place. That's for business. But you as an individual, you got to get your situation in order. And that means your food, that means your energy, your backup power, maybe you have a natural gas generator because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There's a lot of chaos, a lot of concern, but we got to keep focus. Okay. So if you found this video informative, then hit that subscribe and I'll see you tomorrow.